Okay, so Miles, in a recent LA Times op-ed, you described the problem at the moment as having less to do with Trump than with the MAGA base. And you wrote that, and I quote, these highly motivated voters are hungry for MAGA candidates who share their views. And such views will not change overnight. The next Trump will have to feed this beast to win, which means keeping the base radicalized on a steady diet of conspiracy theories about existential threats to their way of life. If you do me the favor, Describe for my listeners how this will manifest in 2024 and how do we get past this moment or, in all fairness, are we just stuck with it for the foreseeable future? Uh, Michael, thanks for having me as always. And look, I will say this. I would be the first to have hoped that it was just about Donald Trump, that the man himself was an aberration and that the Republican Party had not been rotted to the core. In fact, as you know, you know, right after the Trump administration, I gathered a group of Republican senators and congressmen and former cabinet members to go try to reform the GOP, take it back to where it was before Trump. And we failed miserably. And, and I'll be the first to admit that we failed. And it became really evident to me in the past two years as I was working on this book that it wasn't about just Donald Trump. Yes, he's a threat to our democracy. Yes. He's an imminent threat to our democracy. But at the same time, the threat has spiraled much beyond his control. And really, the GOP base has radicalized. So what I was saying in that L.A. Times piece and, and what I say in blowback is that if you do a breakdown of the data, you will find that the average GOP voter looks very much like the MAGA politicians want them to look like. They have favorable views towards political intimidation and mm -hmm. violence. They believe in mainstreamed conspiracy theories. Why does that matter? Because even if Donald Trump is not the nominee, whoever the GOP nominee is, will have to cater to that MAGA base in order to win the presidency. And it's the reason why we face a generational struggle with the MAGA movement is because the base has been so demonstrably radicalized, if you look at the data, that the politicians at the top of the party will continue to cater to it. And, and that's why I call this book a warning to save democracy from the next Trump, because it might be Donald Trump in a second White House term, or it might be a savvier successor, a copycat that tries to carry forward the movement. Isn't that what they all are? I've been calling Ron DeSanctimonious or Ron DeSnotnose or Ron DeSatan. I've been calling him Donald Trump 2.0 forever. And you take people even like a Ted Cruz, you take people like Matt Gates or Josh Hawley, Lauren Boebert, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, name them, just name them, uh, Lindsey Graham. They all are Donald Trump wannabes. It's so amazing. It's the kind of thing that if you had a kid who acted this way in school, he get a timeout or a smack across the side of the head, right? I know today you can't hit the kid, right? But you would certainly give him a fucking timeout and say, hey, this is unacceptable. You know what else is unacceptable? Racism, sexism, misogyny, xenophobia, homophobia, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism. Yeah, they're all bad shit. And why would you want to copy Donald Trump and be a Trump 2.0 when you're talking about these, you know, these attributes? It makes absolutely no sense to me. But, you know, I, I got to say this, Miles. I really want to sort of dig in because I see that beautiful book, you know, that you have over your left shoulder there, your new book called Blowback. I got to tell you, while I was in Otisville, I got, I think, five copies sent to me by just supporters um, who sent me anonymous and I remember I was handing them out you know first of all I put one into the library I'll tell you at Otisville we had an amazing library I must have received over 200 250 of the newest books and I would put them in there everybody would read them you know we'd have uh, you know then we'd have little discussion groups about it I can't tell you the number of people that used to say to me who do you think who do you think wrote anonymous I said I got to tell you at some points, I think it's this person, but then as it moves further down, I just, I never would have picked you, to be very honest with you. <laughs> but, you know, I am truly, I'm truly ecstatic to know, to know you. Uh, and I got to tell you, I enjoyed that book. I am about three quarters of the way now through blowback. 
Um, it's fantastic. It's definitely um, a, a fantastic read. And I want to start. I want to start today by talking about this new book, Blowback, a warning to save America from the next Trump. In one chapter, you describe the doomsday book, which contains, and I quote, the president's break glass options for keeping the country running in situations ranging from global nuclear war to an armed foreign invasion of the United States. I mean, you then go on to describe the powers given to the president at that time as extraordinary. All right. Now, I'll list a few here from the book. Draft authorizations to enable the White House to unilaterally detain dangerous persons, censor the news media, flip an Internet kill switch, take over social media and suspend Americans from traveling. Now, if you do me the favor. Describe for my listeners the nightmare scenario how Trump might have used the documents for non-emergency situations and how close did he actually come in trying to manufacture a crisis so that he could invoke these presidential emergency actions. Well, Michael, in writing this book, I wanted to paint a very clear eyed picture of what a second Trump administration would look like if he retook the White House. And again, what it would look like if a copycat took the White House. So rather than people just listening to me and what my opinion would be for my two years, you know, in the executive branch during the Trump administration and dealing with the man, I wanted to go interview other senior officials that worked with Trump in the White House and at every department uh, and agency, you know, every major department and agency and senior Republicans on Capitol Hill and ask them and their words to describe what Trump would have won, what he would have done if he won reelection and what he would do a second go around. The doomsday book was one of the more alarming things that I was told. And this had never been reported previously. And here's the short version of the story is in 2020, as Donald Trump was getting closer to the reelection, he could have potentially accessed a tool that would have allowed him to cement a, a, a coup. Now, what is this tool? Well, there's a little known book, this book called the Doomsday Book by national security officials that's kept at the White House for the most extraordinary moments if the nation's under threat, a nuclear war, an armed foreign invasion. And it's the responsibility of one top staffer on the National Security Council to protect this book. Now, when I was doing interviews for blowback, I was told that they actually went out of their way to try to keep the president from being aware of the contents of the book, from being aware of the most extraordinary powers that the president has in those circumstances, because there was worry in the White House that Trump or one of his MAGA allies would try to misuse those national security powers. And then there was this extraordinary moment in the lead up to the election where the White House almost installed a MAGA loyalist named Christina Bob into that job on the National Security Council. Now, some of your listeners may know Christina Bob as one of Donald Trump's current lawyers, someone who was uh, on the One America News Network as a hardcore MAGA, uh, you know, talking head. And she was almost placed in that position. Now, what the White House did not know is that if they placed her in that position, she would have had access to one of the most sensitive emergency manuals in the entire government, this doomsday book. And as we later found out, Christina Bob was involved directly in the efforts to overturn the election. Thankfully, this was thwarted. People stopped Christina Bob from getting named to this position. But we were basically that close from one of Trump's closest allies from knowing he had these extraordinary powers, which he could have easily deployed to prevent the transfer of power in 2020. That was something really worrying to me. And it made me think back, Michael, to when I was still in the administration and Trump thought his most extreme power was the Insurrection Act. He'd been told about it. He called it his magical authorities. And at one point in 2019, he wanted to write in the State of the Union that he was invoking the Insurrection Act to go deploy the military to the border uh, to stop migrants from coming in. But if he had done that, which we stopped him from doing it, but if he had done that, there's no telling where he might have used his Insurrection Act powers. And of course, as we know, uh, Donald Trump clearly had an interest in doing that potentially on January 6th. Right. So describe it, though, in terms of non-emergency situations. And I bring that up because, you know, 
you don't need with Donald to have an emergency situation, meaning you don't need to have an attack upon America on American soil. Donald will deem anything to be an emergency situation if it affects him. So just if you can, give me like a non-emergency situation that blowback um, describes in terms of how he would use this, um, you know, this doomsday um, scenario, this doomsday yeah, well, book. One of the worries uh, from the people that I talked to, and again, keep in mind, these are people who'd been appointed by the Trump administration on his National Security Council. The folks that I spoke to are worried that in a, a second term, Donald Trump would use these powers to influence elections. So, for instance, he might uh, target social media companies that are opposed to him. And if you, uh, you know, the information that's in my book about what allegedly is contained in the, in the doomsday book would allow uh, someone like a Trump to potentially do that. So hypothetically, he could cut off access to uh, an Internet provider or a social media company that wasn't friendly towards Donald Trump. He could, as one interviewee told me, deploy the military uh, to the polls to intimidate voters not to vote for the political opposition and instead support the MAGA side. He could potentially go and hunt down innocent people and political opponents and actually jail them under some of these authorities. I mean, this is the type of stuff, Michael, that you would imagine in some B-movie plot about a dictator overtaking the United States. But the authorities that are, again, allegedly contained inside the doomsday book would potentially allow a Trump to act like an actual autocrat and to exercise the powers that he wanted to. And, and that deploying of troops onto U.S. soil is something I heard again and again when I talked uh, to people. In fact, there was this story that I was told uh, and I'd had some connection to it early in the administration about Trump wanting to build his own mercenary army in the united mm -hmm. states so everyone's familiar with the wagner group in russia that putin has well trump was jealous of the wagner group he wanted his own private army and in the course of the administration he tried to get aides to green light a proposal to work with military contractors to create his own private army and, and this is something that defense official told me trump will pursue in a second term he will want to stand up his own mercenary group that's accountable to him. So he doesn't have to worry about the US military exercising a conscience or the oversight committees on Capitol Hill. He wants the authority to tell these troops uh, where to go and what to do, including deploying them on US streets. In fact, a former top counterterrorism official from the Trump administration called it a junior Gestapo. That was his worry is that if the president had been allowed to do this, it would have been a junior Gestapo. Uh, and next go around, they won't be prevented from trying to stand up these structures. So explain to me then how it is. <laughs> I mean, I can't believe you're right. It sounds like a B rated movie or a C rated movie, except for the fact that it happened to me. I mean, what's the difference between the way you describe unilaterally detain what he deems dangerous persons? How is it any different than an unconstitutional remand of a United States citizen, a critic, as I talk about in my book, Revenge, right? As a critic, because I refuse to waive my First Amendment constitutional right. I mean, it's funny because you see all these fucking MAGA morons running around with their AR-15s and their flap jackets and their Kevlar and their fucking helmets waving the 2024 Trump banner, all screaming, you can't take our guns. It's our Second Amendment right. Okay. Okay, I grant you that. But what about my First Amendment? What about my First Amendment right to publish a fucking book and instead... Because Donald didn't want that to happen, he unilaterally has me detained and thrown back into solitary confinement. You could bet your bottom dollar that's exactly what he will do in another term. It's actually why I'm looking, I'm looking outside of the country to potentially move. I mean, if you think that this country is going to be anything recognizable to what you've grown up in, or what you were hoping to leave future generations, it will not. Well, Michael, you know, people like you and I have joked darkly in recent years about the prospect of if Trump wins re-election, 
we will be sent to the terrorist prison at Guantanamo Bay. And then in the course of interviewing people for this book, a number of stories surfaced, including and resurfaced, including the fact that Trump actually did want to go put innocent civilians in the terrorist prison in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, better known as Gitmo. And in fact, at one point, he demanded that officials send migrants from the border into the terrorist prison at Gitmo. And the only reason he was persuaded not to do it wasn't because it would have been illegal, but because the prison wasn't large enough to house large numbers of people. These types of things will become reality in a second term. Now, there was uh, a phrase that someone used. And again, in in, in this book, these officials are mostly cited by name. Uh, Someone warned that in a second term, the motto of the Trump Justice Department would be sue the blue. In other words, use all aspects of prosecutorial authority to go sue political opponents, harass them with special prosecutors, and arrest them wherever possible. And an FBI official gave me a very alarming scenario. He said, look, we've built an entire counterterrorism apparatus in the United States to make it easy for us to find the bad guys and find out derogatory information about them. He said it wouldn't be hard for a wayward president to turn that counterterrorism apparatus against his political rivals. What was the example he cited for me? Was pocket litter at airports. So you know when you go through TSA and you get sent to secondary screening, and if you really get sent to secondary, they make you open your backpack, empty your pockets, and they're allowed to go through some of that information, including at the border. They can go through in detail your electronic devices. This FBI official in the book said, I would worry in a second term about the White House directing that political opponents be sent into secondary to search their pocket litter. So what does Eric Swalwell have on his phone? What does Nancy Pelosi have on her computer? What dirt can they find out from politicians to use against them? Again, Michael, I would be the first to think that this sounded fucking crazy if you told me a few years ago that very credible people lifetime public servants would warn that these things could actually happen but that's the worry about a second term is that donald trump and his allies would fully abuse these powers i mean for instance when talking about the intelligence community i spoke to fiona hill fiona had been donald trump's top russia advisor on the national security council and her biggest worry was that the spy community the intelligence agencies would be weaponized in a second term. Another person who served with Fiona said, yes, we worried about Donald Trump potentially using FISA, the Intelligence Surveillance Act, to use the spy agencies to spy on political opponents. And that's something that I witnessed in the Trump administration. At one point, the president had asked John Kelly if we could tap the phones of White House staff because he wanted to monitor them because he was worried about them saying bad things about them. This man will not be held back in a second term from from violating civil liberties in an extensive way. You know, I'm not 100 percent certain that all of my listeners actually know who Miles Taylor truly is. Right. And I want you to take a minute because I think it's extremely important. You and I are having a very, very scary conversation right now. And I don't want people for a split second to think, oh, these are just two guys with an axe to grind. You were one of his former aides. Do me a favor. Explain your position, right? Describe your relationship with Donald. I mean, how it started, you know, and where, you know, do you still have, you know, relationships with those who remain in his orbit? Because this book is like a horror movie. I, I mean, I, it's it's like another Scream or another Freddy fucking Krueger, if you think about it. It really is. It's terrifying if you read between the lines of what's going on here. So if you would, again, describe the relationship, what you did at DHS and what your role was and so on, because I really want people to take not just this conversation, serious, but I want them to read the book and I want them to understand. The way I see blowback, I see it as almost the, um, uh, we'll call it the second chapter of my book, Revenge, which should have scared the shit out of people in the first place. That in and of itself, like a bookend, you know, to revenge is really what I see it as. If you're not scared shitless from the weaponization of the Justice Department, well, re back and see what else this maniac could do. Well, you know, Michael, and I'll, I'll get to, you know, I'll go 
back in time here in a second, but you were one of the first to predict it. I mean, the title of your book, Revenge, you said was going to be Donald Trump's watchword if he won the White House again. And some people may have heard that and thought it was an overreaction. Well, guess who has said it will be the highest priority in a second Trump administration? Donald Trump. He has said retribution will be his goal. So people like you who've sounded that alarm weren't, you know, fanning the flames of outlandish rhetoric. You were pointing to a very specific, very real and credible threat. And Trump has made clear what that retribution will look like. And the purpose of blowback is to spell that out across every department and agency. How will Trump's allies intend to weaponize the federal government against opponents? And again, they don't have to hear it from me. I I cite people who had been close to the president and some who are still his confidants in this book. But going back in time, as you asked, Michael, you know, I had no interest in getting involved in politics. In fact, I absolutely hate talking about politics. I love talking to you. I hate being out there about politics because like you, I started my career in a totally different space. And that was in national security. And I wanted to remain in national security. And I went into government during the Bush administration after 9-11, worked in the Pentagon, in the White House, in Vice President Cheney's office, on Capitol Hill, working on counterterrorism issues, and then at the Department of Homeland Security. All throughout that time, my focus was cybersecurity, counterintelligence, combating nation state threats from Russia and China. It just wasn't American politics. But when Trump was running for office, Uh, I got very involved in Paul Ryan's efforts when he was Speaker of the House to try to stop Trump because I was really worried about the damage he would do to the Republican Party. I thought there was no chance he could win the presidency, but I thought in the process he would ruin the GOP. So I got involved in what Paul Ryan called his Trump inoculation plan. And clearly we failed miserably. We failed to prevent Trump from winning the nomination and ultimately from winning the presidency. Now, I had no desire to go work with a man like that, but then A mentor of mine, someone I looked up to, John Kelly, got picked to go be Homeland Security Secretary. And I was very persuaded, Michael, by this notion of an axis of adults that was going to keep Trump stable, educate him in the job, and try to keep the executive branch on the rails when this very demonstrably unhinged guy took the job. Uh, We were wrong, though. I went in, I took a job as John Kelly's national National Security Advisor, eventually became chief of staff of the Department of Homeland Security. And we spent a lot of time with Trump in the Oval Office, on Air Force One, in the White House Situation Room. But most importantly, DHS, we were with Trump in moments of consequence, the most important decisions he would have to make in addition to those having to do with the military, to protect lives and livelihoods in the American way of life against hurricanes and tornadoes and terrorists and Chinese spies Those are the moments we would go be with the president. And I've got to tell you, the thing that shocked me and got me to quit that administration and campaign against him was just absolutely how undisciplined and irresponsible he was in moments when American lives were on the line. And you saw it, Michael, firsthand all the time. He was very flippant. He was disinterested in the facts. And he was incredibly reckless. Uh, when it when it really counted and moments that really counted. And, and, and that worried me. That's why I ultimately quit the administration, tried to sound the alarm first with an anonymous opinion piece, but then unmasking myself. And and that's one thing that I write about in this book is it's ironic coming from me. But I really do think anonymity is a danger to our democracy. And I wish I had come forward even sooner because pulling the mask off made it easier for other people to come forward too. And I think the worry this second time around is we still have very senior Republicans like the Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, who still Mm -hmm. support Donald Trump in public, but in private will still say the man is a danger. We need those people to unmask themselves and tell the truth. And ironically, Michael, some of the people I spoke to in this book, some of those senior Republicans looked me in the eye and said, I need you not to use my name in the book and ask me to keep them anonymous. That's a problem. These people need to come forward. And and throughout this period, I'll be urging the people mm-hmm. who spoke to me in the book who didn't want to use their names to come out and attach their names to those comments. Yeah, and they should. By the way, do you have any, um, you're remaining in relations with anybody still in Trump's orbit? Are you hearing anything? Um, look, the funny thing is you don't even really need to hear it from secondhand people donald says it himself i will be your vengeance right i will be your judge your jury your executioner the problem though is that the guy's an idiot right and 
his entire term while he remains alive because he will never ever leave that office it may i'm telling you not because of age he will never leave that office he will avoid a one-term addition he will avoid he will try to become as you said an autocrat as i say all the time a monarch the supreme leader the fuhrer you know the king that's what he wants to be he tells us exactly what he's going to do and yet you're right. There are still people like the Kevin McCarthy's that they just don't care. And you know when they start to care? You know when they start to care? Um, they start to care when it ha- when something happens to them, right? So let me just take you back in time for a second where Trump attacked you via social media as well as at a rally in Tampa. All right, you talk about this in the book. As someone who's experienced this, you know, attacks by Trump on multiple occasions, describe for my listeners how you felt when this shit was happening to you. How it changed your life, not only then, but also today, now. Well, no one has to have sympathy for me, Michael, but like you, I think it's really important to paint a clear picture of what it looks like when the president of the United States, a vindictive, twice impeached, disgraced president of the United States comes. Don't forget sexual assaulter. And uh, you, you got to add that to the list. Uh, this guy's got a, a long rap sheet now, um, but it's it's pretty extraordinary. And we're witnessing this explosion in political intimidation and violence in our country. And when I came out against Trump, uh, it far exceeded my worst visions of what could happen. Now, let's say, for instance, I had quit the Bush administration in protest and campaigned against my former boss, President W. Bush, which I wouldn't have done and very much enjoyed my time in the Bush administration. But let's say I had all that would have happened to me is they would have said, well, you're not in the tribe anymore and we don't affiliate with you. That's about it. But quitting the Trump administration and campaigning against the former president, as I often say, ended up costing me my home. It cost me my job. It cost me close relationships. It cost my family their security and my own security, such that I ended up on election night 2020 in a safe house in Northern Virginia under armed guard and facing death threats because of how serious the situation had become. Now, at the time, I thought maybe that was unique in in how extreme it was and how extreme the vitriol was from Trump supporters after he named me in those rallies and continued to urge people to look me up. But then I heard story after story of federal, state, local officials, especially in the post-election period, that experienced the same thing. These crowdsourced death threats, the doxing, the attempts to find them. I mean, I had my, I had people posting pictures of my sister and my nieces and their home and their addresses and saying our blood would be in the streets. I mean, this is really terrifying stuff and there's no playbook for it for when your family is hit with this. And this was happening across the country. Now, you know, for the book, In blowback, I talked to a number of people like Adam Kinzinger, former Republican member of Congress, Denver Riggleman, and others, and they made clear to me that their colleagues in the House, those that the very few that spoke out against Donald Trump, they had to go get pistols, concealed carry permits for their children and family members. I mean, the threats got really extreme, and a lot of those people ended up leaving Congress because of it and and saying so publicly. Fred Upton, who was a congressman, Republican congressman from Michigan, stalwart conservative said he just couldn't put up with the threats anymore. I think his comment to me was, you know, I'm fast, but I'm not that fast. And, you know, these people are crazy. Um, I, I never thought I would see that in my life, that we would have public officials running for their lives. And, and to put a data point on it, Michael, the chatter we are seeing about threats to American public servants, especially from the far right, is greater in volume than the chatter we saw after 9-11 in terms of threats to public servants. So just put that in perspective, the largest terrorist attack in the history of the world, we are seeing in some senses a higher statistical threat level now than we did in that window, and it's coming from inside the house. Because in your book, 
you talk about that Tampa rally. You talk about multiple rallies. And Donald's line that he used, and I quote, bad things are going to happen to him. Naming you. What? Let me just be very clear. Knowing Donald as well as I do, and I do know him. I haven't been wrong yet. What he was doing is he was sending a coded message to that vast swath of the 28% of the GOP that is seriously indoctrinated into the cult. Where maybe he was hoping that something bad was going to happen to you. And by saying it this way, he still leaves himself with enough wiggle room to say, I didn't even know this kid. I didn't want to see anything happen to anybody. But I predicted when you do shit like this, bad things happen to people, right? What he's doing is the same sort of nonsense that he does. It's part of the Trump playbook. He was calling to action these MAGA maniacs that are willing to go to prison for him, right? For periods of time, whether it's 90 days or 18 years, simply well, based upon what they determine. And, and Michael, as you know, we actually have seen people respond to the call, not just January 6th, of course, which is, which is the biggest example. But, you know, when authorities raided Trump's home a year ago looking for the classified documents that he stole, uh, you know, he called the FBI the fascist bureau of, of investigation. Days later, we had a guy with an AR-15 and a nail yep. gun storm an FBI field office on behalf of Trump, they do respond to this call. And when he came out in my case and he said bad things are going to happen to Miles Taylor, it was a dog whistle, as you know. It was a command for people to do bad things. Uh, and again, no one has to have sympathy for me. I went into this fight clear eyed. But if you just want to get a sample of those messages, I mean, go to my Twitter page at, at Miles Taylor USA. I've got a clip at the top there of just a sample of the voicemails people like me, people like you, Michael, and others get from these lunatics who find our information. They're not just doing that because they stumble upon us on the web. It's because people like Trump have made it clear that their supporters should harass us and our families and, and our friends and innocent people around us. Uh, and, and that's something that I think is really alarming because it's spread beyond Donald Trump. Again, his ethos has infected the Republican Party. Don't believe me. Again, look at the examples people give in blowback. And I'll give you two examples now about how Trumpism has spiraled even beyond what Donald Trump was willing to do. There was two things in the first term he wanted us to do that he walked back from. One was busing and dumping migrants in, in sanctuary cities, and another was cleaning house at the FBI. And let me drill into both of those. On the busing and dumping of migrants, President said to us in 2019, I want you to take the murderers, the criminals and the rapists that you catch at the border, DHS, and I want you to ship them into democratic cities to cause hmm. chaos and disorder and instability. Sure. This was a real request from the White House. I had to go to our lawyers and get them to tell me in writing, yes, this would be illegal, which I passed along to the White House, the chief of staff, Stephen Miller, and said, we cannot do this. Trump begrudgingly held back. Second, the president wanted to gut the FBI. And we know he fired Jim Comey, but then he stopped short because he was worried about getting impeached. Well, guess what? Those two thwarted Trump policies are now mainstream positions of the Republican Party. Ron DeSantis in Florida and Greg Abbott in Texas have both picked up the busing and dumping of migrants mm -hmm. concept with alacrity. And now they're using migrants as political pawns around the country. Look at the FBI. We all thought that was a fringe Donald Trump policy position that he wanted to cleanse the nation's premier investigative agency. But now if he returns to power, Trump, we know, wants to install political loyalists over there. And it's become a top talking point of the Republican Party was is to take a wrecking ball to that institution and install political operatives effectively. These are two examples of Trumpism infecting the wider GOP. And I think it's what we could expect if Trump or a copycat wins the White House, is those things that he was prevented from doing being implemented on steroids in a second term? Yeah, look, uh, I, I get it. Um, I, <laughs> I really get it. Uh, I, I had a problem with Trump's desire to completely eradicate the FBI. Complete, I mean, literally, he wanted to get rid of the entire agency. Now, to get rid of one person, I get it. 
you know, he has the right to do that. James Comey only serves at the pleasure of Donald Trump, of the president. And I'm not a massive fan of Comey, uh, to be very honest with you. I think Comey has a lot of um, personal desires on his own. You know, if I ask the average person, name two FBI directors. Well, everybody knows, right, J. Edgar Hoover. I mean, everybody just knows that name because he's been such a interesting character over the course of the last, you know, 50 years. Uh, books written about him, movies made about him, about his antics and so on. And then you ask him, well, name another. Name another. Well, I always would say Louis Freed. Why? Eh, he was Jewish. Right. And so, you know, that for me, I was always impressed that there was, you know, a Jew who could make it, you know, to the head of the FBI. Most people couldn't name another FBI director until James Comey. He wanted to be that number two, that number three, that everybody would know his name. Well, my brother, this ain't fucking cheers. All right. And, you know, everybody didn't need to know your name. One of the reasons most people don't know FBI directors is because they kind of stay silent. They stay to the side, but not Comey. He was very much front and center. And at like six foot seven, you know, not it's not an easy task, if you know what I mean. Well, it, it, and I think that we're going to see, uh, unfortunately, if in a, a second Trump administration and a Trump 2.0, other departments and agencies that you would normally think should be in obscurity, being front and center. And, and one of those, Michael, that I was, again, very surprised by in these conversations was the Department of Veterans Affairs. We don't talk about the VA very much. People think of it as a sleepy institution that does the right thing and it takes care of America's veterans. In the course of writing blowback, I spoke to t Trump's top appointees who were running the Department of Veterans Affairs, who revealed to me that there were plans in a second term to, quote, detonate the VA and gut veterans health care benefits. Why? Because Donald Trump found out that the VA had the second biggest budget in the federal mm -hmm. government, $250 billion, and he wanted to use it as a piggy bank. He was frustrated spending money on veterans. As we know, he has a long history of animosity towards military veterans because, presumably, it's because he's self-conscious about the fact that he himself didn't serve. And his top officials told me over there, and they're named in the book, that Trump wanted to detonate the VA, kick veterans out on the street, and he didn't care because in the, in the words of one former deputy secretary of the Department of Veterans Affairs, he thought veterans were, quote, lazy malingerers. And he wanted to spend that money elsewhere. This is really disturbing for a lot of reasons. One, because Americans want to take care of their military veterans. But no, no, two, no, 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 no. I'm so sorry, Miles. Americans are obligated to take care of the veterans. They fought for us. They saved our democracy. They put their lives on the line. We fucking owe it to them. All right. And I'm going to tell you a couple stories also uh, as it relates to the VA. Don't forget, I was the one who brought David Shulkin, the secretary of the VA, to the table because I knew David from well before, um, you know, way, way, way before Donald ever did. Well, yeah. And, and, and Michael, I would love to hear your, your perspective on this because this was something I didn't expect uh, folks to say is that there would be this priority to essentially break the veterans health care apparatus in a second term. And what was more alarming is that department leaders said they had the authority to do it. You know, the president had the authority if he'd wanted to execute that order to destroy the veterans safety net, which not only throw the, throws those millions of veterans potentially out on the street, but actually the American health care system, people don't realize, is heavily dependent on the VA. A lot of doctors, their very first job is they go into the veterans healthcare system. So this would be a major national security crisis to break that veterans healthcare system. I was told the only reason Trump was persuaded not to do that in a first term is political advisors convinced him that it would hurt him very badly in reelection with, of course, the veterans community if he broke the veterans healthcare network. So they shelved it 
to wait to a second term to destroy that institution. People need to wake up. I mean, we all remember in 2020 the stories coming out about Trump being in France, talking about veterans being suckers and losers because they died uh, you know, in combat. This yeah. perception is not just a gross viewpoint. It's one that could affect the lives of millions of American veterans if we give the MAGA movement another shot at the White House. But, Michael, I'm curious to hear, you know, what you thought, you know, what oh, his I'm perspective gonna, oh, I'm was gonna on get, the VA. I'm going to get, oh, yeah, I'm going to get into that in about a half a second. I did just want to ask you one quick question, because as a result of, you know, Trump's comments, and I, again, I know this all too well, and it's, it's fucking painful. They, you stated in the book that um, there was a billionaire who was actually willing to fund your security detail. But you ended up not accepting it. I'm just curious because you don't name who the billionaire is. Me personally, I can't find anybody, you know, to help me despite, you know, all of my cooperation. I'm just curious, um, who's the billionaire that has enough um, moxie and enough, um, uh, well, what's the right word for it? Um, it just has enough empathy for somebody like yourself who put his ass on the line for this country, right, by exposing the dangers of Trump, that they'd be willing to fund your security? Well, uh, you know, ironically, that person wishes to remain anonymous, and, and I'll respect those <laughs> wishes. But I, but I got to tell you, Michael, you know what it's like in that moment when you turn against the tribe. There are very few people there to support you. And this is someone who I didn't know someone who I knew of and admired because they're a public person who reached out in the wake of Trump saying bad things are going to happen to Miles Taylor and someone who was very perceptive in knowing that that would result in an avalanche of death threats against our family. And the person reached out and said, look, I know you can't afford it. Let me help you get protection. And I was really grateful for that outreach. But but you make a really good point, Michael. Most folks especially these public servants on the front lines who continue to get threatened for defending democracy, they don't have a Silicon Valley billionaire who's going to call them on speed dial and say, I'd like to help out. I mean, we're talking about something that's become an epidemic, the political intimidation and threats uh, and violence. And, you know, Trump and his allies in the MAGA movement continue uh, to promote that such that we're, we're seeing in polls. I mean, there was an NPR poll that showed one in four Americans have a favorable attitude of violence towards the government. There was a famous University yeah. of Chicago survey last year that showed one in 10 Americans, some some 35 million American adults believed that force would be justified to restore Donald Trump to the White House. One in 10 Americans believing we should forcibly put him back in the White House. We've never seen numbers like that from a public safety and national security perspective. You know, I've made this point on television, which I thought... Um... It was going to get more attention, but it really didn't. So here I am now, the recipient of a lawsuit by Trump, a $500 million lawsuit, Southern District of Miami. It's a complete bullshit case. It's retaliation against me, again, by Donald because of the DA's case and the AG's case and um, my case going to trial against him on July 24th. It's all retaliation by Donald. And Adam Parkmenko, God bless this guy, went ahead, created this website, uh, GoFundMe, right? I had nothing to do with it. He did it and so then turned it over to my lawyer. I think we've raised about $225,000. Um, the initial is going to be $250,000 that's needed just to get to the discovery stages, which we're at right now. And so it's probably going to cost close to a million dollars, this litigation, to defend myself. I'm at 225000 Now, don't get me wrong. I thank every supporter from the one guy who gave fifty grand to the person who donated a dollar. I thank every supporter. I truly do. But then there's this guy on the subway here in New York who choked a homeless guy out and killed him. And he's already raised over $3.5 million for his defense fund. Right? I mean, he choked the guy out. The guy, the, the guy who he choked out probably weighed 120, 130 pounds, wet, chokes him out. And yet the right, the right wing, 
They're so okay with the violence that in drones, they just give money, whether it's $10, 20 or 100 makes no difference. This guy has three plus million dollars in the bank for his use, for defense, etc. I don't get it. I don't get it. My lawsuit is to hold Donald Trump accountable, right? This is the kind of action that's going to put Donald on the stand and we're going to learn a whole lot more about about the guy. But for some unknown reason, I can't explain it. The conservative, they just, I, I, I don't, they just, they just give. I can't explain it. You know what I mean? Um, they just, they well, just and they attack give. too. I mean, I think, Michael, you're the perfect example of how there is an active strategy right now in MAGA circles to sue opponents of the former president into silence. And we've seen that with a number of folks. What do you yourself. think my $500 million lawsuit is? You think that's exactly. not to keep me silent? Stephanie Grisham, Olivia Troy. I mean, they're going after people who they see as a threat and trying to sue them into silence. And it's really important for folks to stand up and back those individuals like you so that they can continue to tell the truth about Trump uh, and hold him accountable because they actually perceive this to be an effective strategy because they know how expensive it is to tie people up in litigation. The, Trump used to talk about it. I mean, you and I have talked about this before. I'm sure he said it far more often in your presence, but I remember him coming into the Oval Office and saying, this is how you get people to do things you want. You sue them. Because whether I, or not Miles, you have a case. I, Miles, I used to do that for him, but not not to take away people's constitutional rights. I'm talking against, you know, other developers. I'm talking against, you know, contractors. I'm talking, you know, uh, shit like that. Things that nobody has any business other than between the Trump organization, Donald, and the president CEO of whoever the contractor was. I mean, we're not talking about apples to apples, though that's what he learned. He learned that he could take advantage of these contractors, of these smaller people, by scaring the shit out of them into a $500 million lawsuit. But at this point in time, I'm so beaten and damaged, it ain't going to happen. All right? I'm just, I walk with my head up high like you, right? I'm not thinking about these threats from these lunatics. Right. I, I like you. I also don't have a security detail. That's OK. Right. I'm going to continue to do my thing. I'm going to continue to speak truth to power and I'm going to continue to ensure that Donald Trump is held accountable, not for things that he didn't do, but for things that he did do for things that if it was you and certainly as it was for me, you end up seeing prison time. Right now, let me just jump in for a second and talk to you about the whole thing with the um, secretary of the VA. So I knew David mm -hmm. Shulkin through mutual friends for years, for years. And Donald first was looking at a handful of different people and none of them wanted the job. Remember, he didn't have his book prepared that if in fact he won the election, that we would already be calling up John Kelly, we'd be calling up, you know, um, David Shulkin, we'd be calling up whoever these cabinet members might be. He thought it was bad luck. He didn't want to do it. I took from Scaramucci his book on uh, Romney that he had to show Trump what it looks like. And he said it was bad luck. Give it to Steve Bannon, you know, or give it to Kellyanne Conway. I don't want to see it. I'm not doing it. And it wasn't that he didn't do it because it was bad luck. He didn't do it because he never thought he was going to win. And he thought it would be a waste of time calling all of these people. And maybe he would feel that he would owe them something if they said yes. So all of a sudden, everybody's now scrambling to find qualified people that they knew for various positions, including ambassadorships and so on. Well, in this specific case... He could not find anybody to take on the role of the secretary of the VA. And I turned around and I said to him, hey, boss, there's a guy named Dave Shulkin, who I happen to know for a long time. In fact, David currently is the undersecretary of the VA under Obama, to which Donald looks at me. He goes, Michael, are you out of your fucking mind? 
I said, why? So he goes, why in the world? What kind of an asshole would I look like if I bring in someone like this guy who's a Democrat who had previously worked under the Obama administration as the assistant under, as the undersecretary to the VA? I said, boss, he's a Republican. I said, he's really qualified. He's an administrator. In fact, just to give you an idea, when Melania burnt herself at Bedminster, he's the one that we got in order to help her through the entire process because she, you know, she burnt herself with hot water uh, at Bedminster. He goes, yeah. I'm like, yeah. And in fact, M Melania liked him a lot. You liked him. You even sent him a thank you card. So he goes, oh, okay, bring him in. And then there were others that were going to work in some sort of a think tank with the VA. But the whole goal at that time was to dismantle the VA. And it's, it was an interesting thought process. Sell off everything. That's the VA. And you'll have a ton of money that's there. Because the VA, there is a substantial, in his mind, there's a substantial amount of waste. There's facilities that have all brand new equipment that's not even being used. And the service, in Trump's opinion, because this is a means to an end, that the service is not even secondary, not even tertiary. It's subservice by these doctors that are bilking the system. And this, again, is all part where we'll sell off the equipment to third world countries and have a couple of billion dollars sitting in the back. But what they wanted to do is to offer to every veteran a special United States government military insurance card that every doctor has to accept It'd be like a Medicare, Medicaid, but it's any doctor that you want to go to, and they must give you an appointment within 24 hours. That part I kind of liked, where that these veterans that are going through, whether it's emotional issues, PTSDs, they need medication, uh, they have uh, injuries that are causing them pain, they must be seen within 24 hours, all right? I thought the idea was great, but to dismantle the entire VA simply so that, you know, they can bank all of this money to the side so he could use it for other things like military or just to park to the side for infrastructure. That's just wrong. You don't do that to people. If you're going to try to make something right uh, out of the VA, to improve it, try to figure out how to improve it for the people that need it the most. And that's the people that put the most on the line for our country. Michael, you, you said it so well, and, and I think you make a very important point, which is, you know, the VA system, as, as a lot of veterans know, is broken. It has to be reformed. But Trump's own people went to him at the White House from the VA and said, what you want to do with a wrecking ball approach approach will kill veterans. You've got to phase this in. If you want to take this wrecking ball and gut the VA to use it as a piggy bank, you are going to put lives in danger. That's not what persuaded Donald Trump not to do it. What persuaded him is that it would hurt his reelection to do it. And I think that's the big concern is policies like this, these zombie policies uh, will come back to life if he's restored to the White House. That's that's the big concern. Yeah, I totally agree. So let me ask you, so let me just go to one more juicy bit in the book. If you would, talk to me about Trump and Ivanka and what he said to John Kelly. Because I've heard him speak like this before, but I want, I want it from your mouth. I want to know your experience as it relates to uh, what was said and in what context, et cetera. Yeah, you know, the misogyny inside Trump's world is really well known. And, you know, you've seen it, Michael, with him. And I saw it with senior female figures in the administration 
who he made inappropriate comments about their makeup and their weight and, you know, things of a sexual nature. I mean, that was almost secondhand for comments like that to happen in his orbit. Now, the one that John Kelly had shared with me, I wasn't there for this, but, you know, Kelly's unimpeachable in his integrity, in my view, was a comment that the president had made about thinking that Ivanka's breasts and her backside were so attractive that he would want to have sex with her, which prompted Kelly to say to the president, you know, she's your daughter, Mr. President. The fact that his own chief of staff had to remind him that the person's body they were talking about was his own daughter was really disgusting to me. And and as Kelly relayed the story, his comment was, Miles Trump is a very, very evil man. And I actually debated Michael about whether to include that story in this book because It's so disgusting. It's so outlandish. But I've got to think that even MAGA supporters of Donald Trump will draw the line at incest, right? There's at least got to be a line there. And that's who this man is. It's important for them to know the character of this person that a lot of them still worship, who is the head of the Republican Party, who's leading the GOP field right now, is a man who's made incestuous comments And I actually didn't even realize, Michael, until this story came out, how extensive that history is of his perverse comments about his daughter until people started to send me supercuts of these radio interviews and TV interviews and print interviews where he's made these sexualized references uh, to his daughter. So, look, I'm a national security guy, not a political guy. But, dear God, if I have any political instinct whatsoever, it's hopefully that people will hear about a politician expressing incestuous feelings towards his own daughter and think I can maybe vomit. that person's not fit for public office. Yeah, I mean, maybe that person's not fit to <laughs> to walk around our streets and in, in our, you know, in our great country. I mean, fucking They have a hate, place for right? people like that, Michael. They have a place for yeah. people like that, and it's prison. Yeah, it's, it's called hell. Right. So if you if you would Touché. talk to talk to me about schedule. Right. They, I've always heard there was that thing. Right. There's a special place in hell for people like that. Incest. Come on, man. You know, I mean, he used to talk about Ivanka as being, you know, every girl wants to be like Ivanka and every guy wants to sleep with her. That's why he would send her on certain tasks. And I've said that, you know, publicly before. So obviously everything that you're saying here is, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, rings truth. So if you would talk to me about what is Schedule F? Um, I mean, what, is, what, what exactly is it and how will it affect the government should Trump get reelected? Yeah, well, you know, Schedule F is one of those things, Michael, that sounds like a boring bureaucratic term and could also be a bulldozer in a second Trump administration. So this is an authority that the president had developed when Donald Trump was still in office, that would have given him the ability to fire America's civil servants at key departments and agencies. So the public servants who aren't political, they're appointed, you know, experts across the government. And, you know, at the time, people thought, again, this was outlandish because we have civil service protections of this in this country. So that if you get hired to work for NASA, if you get hired to work for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration as an expert, that you keep your job, regardless of who's president, Democrat or Republican, that those experts stay. And we don't replace them with political campaign aides and lackeys and loyalists because we want a federal government that functions, right? The person who disperses the Social Security check should not be a Trump minion. It's just someone who you know needs to know how to disperse Social Security checks. But Trump wanted to fire these people because he believed there was a so-called deep state out to get him. And so they developed this authority called Schedule F to be able to fire tens of thousands of federal civil servants. Since that time, and this is another example of Trumpism extending beyond the former president, a lot of his acolytes have praised the idea of Schedule F and have said they will bring it back if they are elected to office. And you can count on the fact that in a second Trump administration, that they would fire tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of civil servants to cleanse the government, to install political loyalists. Again, don't believe me, believe Trump's own aides who in this book talked to me about the different places that could happen. And especially there were concerns among the people I talked to about the emergency response functions 
of the government and Trump's desire to install in those agencies people who would weaponize federal aid to support red states and to punish blue states. And I also saw this firsthand when there was a tornado or a hurricane. Trump was always looking for leverage in the form of federal aid. Ah, is Mm -hmm. the government going to send billions to help people whose houses have burned down? Well, is it a blue state? If it's a blue state, I want you to hold back the money until I get something from them. That's not how the federal government's supposed to operate. When you dial 911, they don't say, are you a Democrat or a Republican before they come respond? They come respond. In a second Trump administration, there will be a litmus test, a political litmus test for whether Americans get the federal aid they need in emergencies. And he'll do that by being able to gut the bureaucracy of those experts with scheduling. Absolutely 100%. So look, Miles, the hour goes by really quickly. I could sit and probably have you on for two hours. I want to ask you one last question, because some of this actually resulted from your first book, Anonymous, which my understanding and speaking to people that were still in his orbit at the time was driving him fucking crazy. They couldn't figure out who was uh, who was it that wrote this book and how many other, as he would call them, leakers are there out there. There came a point in time that Trump actually talked about having White House aides' phones tapped. I mean, this is unfucking precedented. Right. I mean, the closest, of course, would be Nixon, but that doesn't it pales in comparison. What do you know about this? You know, Stephanie Grisham, who I spoke to for both this book and a podcast with iHeartMedia called The Whistleblowers, actually told me more about this than I had even realized at the time, which was, you know, she said, that the op-ed when it dropped the anonymous op-ed and then and then my book a warning drove the president so crazy that they would be in completely unrelated meeting and he would quiz everyone in the room about who it was he tweeted at the time treason question mark formed a task force to try to hunt down the author and became so paranoid that he said to white house chief of staff john kelly that he wanted to wiretap the phones of white house staff and I remember that being shared with me at the time and and being just so astonished that the president of the United States could be that ignorant of the law to think that he had the ability to just wiretap innocent civilians, even if they worked for him, to monitor their phones and get away with it. These are the types of things that we should fully expect him to do if he comes back into office. There won't be John Kelly's to tell him, as Kelly did at the time, no, Mr. President, You cannot do that. That's illegal. There will be people who say yes. And, you know, there were folks who in writing blowback told me exactly that, that they believe that Trump will try to weaponize the U.S. intelligence community to monitor political rivals and also his own team potentially in a second term. And it's not speculation because he tried to do it. We know he tried to do it. We were there. And, you know, just there's an avalanche, just a mountain, if you will, of evidence Mm -hmm of how absolutely unfit this man is for public office. I even though was astonished by the things that people shared might happen in a second term if Trump or a copycat goes back to the White House. Well, as always, Miles, great to see you, my friend. Great to speak to you. Stay safe. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for uh, providing this information, which is so desperate as we, you know, come close to the 2024 election, which is why I constantly say, not just here, but on my other podcast, Political Beatdown, vote blue. Thanks, Michael. Good to see you, my brother. I'll see you soon.